Here's what's going on this week at ALCF. We're building our team of contributors to greet guests after services and provide information about the ALCF community and activities. Find out how you can be part of this vital ministry at the contributors meeting on Sunday, October 13th from 12 to 12.30 p.m. in Classroom 3. If you have a passion for worship, fellowship, and fun, ALCF's worship team is looking for you. Candidates will be scheduled for auditions on a Sunday in October, right after service. Please email your interest to worship at alcf.net. We can't wait to worship with you. If you've ever been interested in ministry at ALCF or wanted to develop as a leader, be sure to check out our monthly leadership community gatherings. It's a great opportunity to connect with and learn from other church leaders who can equip you with tools to help you grow your gifts and leadership skills. Our next meeting takes place on Saturday, October 26th from 1030 a.m. to noon in the chapel. If you are new to Abundant Life and want to learn about our story, vision, and values, be sure to join us for our complimentary guest luncheon, This is ALCF. The event takes place after service on Sunday, October 27th from 12 to 1 p.m. in the chapel. Ladies, make plans to attend the women's 12th annual Christmas tea, Emmanuel God With Us. It promises to be a memorable event with great food, praise, and worship by Michelle Lewis and friends, along with a special message from Margie Fennell. This event takes place on Saturday, December 14th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. To sign up for any of these upcoming events, go to alcf.net slash signups or check out the ALCF app. And remember, Abundant Life exists to make a better you for a better world. So Father, thank you for your grace. We can't even understand it. All of our flaws and faults and failures. And you have never given up on us. Thank you for your grace. We haven't earned it or it wouldn't be grace. So all we can do is receive it and say thank you. Will you tell them thank you? Now speak to us from your word today. Someone needs to be encouraged. There's a broken relationship that needs to be repaired. There's a soul that needs to be saved. I can't do any of these things, but I call on one who can. So may that same grace that caught us and repaired our relationship with you, may you catch someone today by that same grace and bring them into right relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, meet me in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. Redrick, if you're here, we met for lunch the other day. I got your book. Uh, so let's, um, let's connect after service. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9. If you're new with us today, you should know we've been in a series on the Sermon on the Mount. If you wouldn't call yourself a Christian or maybe you do call yourself a Christian but you are a novice to the scriptures um, and you're wanting to know uh, kind of what the Bible is all about, specifically what following Jesus is all about. Uh, Don't start in Genesis, although that's a great book, but you'll die a slow death once you get to Leviticus. I want to encourage you, a great place to start is the Sermon on the Mount, which is simply Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. If I was preaching uh, in the 80s, I would say the Sermon on the Mount is the cliff notes to the Christian life. But here in Silicon Valley in the 21st century, I'd rather say it's the blinkest uh, to the Christian life. It gives us a good synopsis of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things that we said from jump as you just make your way through the Sermon on the Mount, beware, uh, there's going to be times in which you're going to feel overwhelmed. Your chest is going to get tight. You you might uh, suffer a mild spiritual panic attack because you'll have this sense of, I just can't do this. It's impossible. That's why we've called this series Impossibly Christian. If you could do this in your own strength, you wouldn't need a savior. All right? So God deliver me from any religion I can do in my own strength. I can't do this in my own strength. I can't, I can't, I can't, but praise God, he can, he can, he can. 
As the Sermon on the Mount gets started, Jesus begins with uh, a set of what we would call kingdom character traits. We might call them beatitudes. Now, the beatitudes, um, we've learned, are not formulas to get us into the kingdom of heaven. So they're not given to us for Jesus to say, hey, do these things, you'll get saved. That's work salvation. Nor are the Beatitudes um, equations we do to earn God's favor, right? So I need a new job, uh, money is tight, things aren't going well in my life, let me hurry and go to Matthew chapter 5, let me try these things out. If I do them, they're kind of like my genie in a bottle, and Jesus will see I'm being a good girl, good boy, and he'll bless me with what I want. God is not your cosmic vending machine. So these aren't things we do to earn God's favor. In fact, you should know that God is already pleased with you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. So believers don't work for approval, we work from approval. But what the Beatitudes are, are they are distinctive articles of clothing that kingdom of heaven people wear that makes us stand out in the middle of the world. That's what they are. So these are garments that by God's spirit I put on that makes me stand out, not in a self-righteous way, but in a way that attracts the beauty and aroma of Christ. So, for example, our beatitude today in a world that says, blessed are those who take vengeance. Blessed are those who are vindictive. Blessed are those that if you cut me, I cut you back. Or blessed are those that if you tick me off, I wake up early in the morning and send out a whole bunch of tweets. No, it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, neighbor, fasten your seatbelts. He's going to get in your business. All right, here we go. All y'all introverts are mad at me right now. Tom and Thordis were high school students in Iceland. Thordis was from Iceland. Her boyfriend, Tom, was an exchange student from Australia. They had just started dating. In fact, one of their first dates was the annual Christmas dance. They were so excited to go, but soon after the dance, tragedy struck. Tom assaulted and raped Thordis for two long hours. Naturally, they broke up. She was devastated. For the next nine years, she wallowed in a mire of low self-esteem, lack of confidence, even shame. She felt this pervasive sense of being dirty, Her sense of self-worth was out the window. She tried to find peace, but she couldn't. In fact, she had this growing sense that the only way she would ever find peace, true story, is if she would reach out to the man who assaulted her, Tom. So she sent him an email. Tom, by this time, had moved back to Australia. He emailed back. He seemed contrite, apologetic. He said all the right things. And for the next eight years, Tom and Thordis emailed back and forth. 
But still, Fortis had this thing in her where, yes, she was feeling better, but she hadn't arrived at that place called peace. And she began to have the feeling, eight years into the email correspondence, that the only way she was ever going to truly have peace is if she could look Tom in the eyes and share her story. So she pitched the idea. Tom says, whatever you need to do, I'm there. They picked a halfway point to rendezvous between her Iceland and his Australia, a place that was known historically for being a place of reconciliation, South Africa. So they bought plane tickets and they rendezvoused in Cape Town, South Africa, where they spent a week together. Tom and Thordis, eyeball to eyeball. Thordis even invited Tom into her hotel room just to chat and to dialogue. In tears, she poured out her heart. In tears, he listened and confessed. And they chronicled their journey in a book they co-wrote together called South of Forgiveness. If you have not read it. Not only that, but they, they did a TED Talk. Where in the first week of their TED Talk being viewed, it was viewed over two million times. People could not believe the lengths Thordis would go to to make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. In order to get at this, we have to back up a little bit. To state the obvious, you and I live in a world that is marred by sin. And sin is wreaking havoc all over the place. You've heard me say this before, but when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, the first thing they do is they hide from God and they hide from each other. At the end of Genesis 2, there was openness and vulnerability. They were, the Bible says, naked and unashamed. Then in chapter 3, sin enters into the world and they hide from each other. They sow fig leaves and they hide from God. And that's what sin does. Sin wreaks havoc and tears at the fabric of our relationships. The Bible is clear, sin is not just personal, but my sin impacts those around me. It tears up relationships. We know this because look at their child Cain. Cain kills Abel. A little while later, just another example, look at David. David is a home wrecker. His sin tore up a home, commits adultery, and kills her husband, and look a little while later, we see tribes, even in Israel, going to war against each other. Why their sin, and nations going to war? Why over sin? And a little while later in the New Testament, Jesus tells the story of a rebellious son who is bent on having things his own way, disrespects his, his parents, leaves the home, tears the home up, ruins the inheritance. Sin is not just personal. It rips at the fabric of relationships. This isn't a profound point. You don't have to spend a day in seminary to know this. Just look at your own lives. All of us, not all of you, all of us in this room can testify. Just take a relationship audit in your own life, and you probably right now have a relationship or two or three or six or 12 that is not what it used to be. And you keep on digging backwards, and the reason for that is a little three-letter word with I right in the middle of it. Sin. I can come by your house, put my feet on your coffee table. Some of you things ain't right with your father. Maybe he abandoned you when you really needed him. And that relationship has never been right. 
because of his sin. Others of you, we can go the other way. Maybe there's a relationship that ain't right with your child, and your child is this selfish, narcissistic, entitled person who thinks the world revolves around them. No amens, please. And they're so selfish, they don't even see their own selfishness. And that relationship is not thriving. And you're grieving over it because of their sin. Others of you, you've, you've got a child maybe um, out of wedlock or, or, or a child with a person you used to be married to and that marriage doesn't work and now every single month when you go to send the child support payment, you're reminded of a relationship that once was but now is no longer and it broke up either your fault or her fault but any way you want to cut it because of sin. Some of us, we got Thanksgiving coming right around the corner. And our chest is already getting tight because we're going to park our feet over someone's table. They're going to park their feet under our table, and they're, shoot me now. They're just passive aggressive and sarcastic and just don't like them, downright awkward. My goodness, if we didn't share DNA, I'd never want to see you again in life. (laughs) She's getting a little too happy over here. If I just passed the mic, we could spend all week long just talking about the mess that's in our own house. As long as there's sin and messed up relationships, those are going to always be opportunities for peacemaking. Y'all ain't got to amen. If you get nothing else I say in this little Sunday school lesson we've got going on this morning, I want you to get this, because if you miss this, you'll miss the whole crux of the message. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. But the question on the table is, what exactly is a peacemaker? If I were to define a peacemaker, I'd define it this way. Drink these words in slowly. Here it is. A peacemaker is one who at risk to themselves and the relationship steps into the conflict and the brokenness with the singular aim to bring about restoration and and, and wholeness. A peacemaker is one who at risk to themselves and the relationship steps into into the conflict and the brokenness with the singular aim to bring about restoration and wholeness. Notice Jesus does not say, blessed are the conflict avoiders. Notice Jesus does not say, blessed are the peace-loving. Notice Jesus does not say, blessed are the peaceful. But he says, blessed are the peacemakers. I love it. One scholar says along these lines, William Barclay says, the peace which the Bible calls blessed does not come from the evasion of issues. It comes from facing them, dealing with them, and conquering them. What this beatitude demands is not the passive acceptance of things because we are afraid of the trouble of doing anything about them, but the active facing of things and the making of peace even when the way to peace is through struggle. What are we saying? First of all, peacemaking implies conflict. Something's wrong. Something's off. The relationships hit a bump in the road. There's a conflict here. Jesus acknowledges this. Where does conflict come from? It it comes from, in many cases, not in every case, but in most cases, it comes from sin. And as long as there's sin, there's going to be the need for peacemakers. But here's our problem. When it comes to conflict, there's two kinds of people in the room right now. 
turtles and sharks. When it comes to conflict, two kinds of people in the room right now, turtles and sharks. We all know how a turtle deals with conflict, right? Turtle senses conflict, what does it do? It withdraws. Let me act like I don't see it. <laughs> man, I remember, I remember, man, when I, I went to school in Philadelphia, and I used to love living in Philadelphia because, I mean, right there in that northeast corridor, you, I mean, Thursdays we'd get together, me and my roommates, what are we going to do this weekend? Sometimes we'd go up to New York, and I remember uh, I was dating a young lady in the Bronx, and I remember hanging out uh, in the Bronx, going up to the Bronx, catching the one, one, uh, one train to go see this young lady uh, at the time, and I'm with a buddy of mine, first time on the one train, and I noticed uh, we're having this great conversation face-to-face, and every time we'd stop, um, um, he'd, he'd close his eyes the most awkward thing in the world. We'd talk and talk and talk, and all of a sudden, we'd stop, door open, close his eyes. And then as soon as the door closed, we'd take off again. He'd open up his eyes and resume the conversation. I'm like, this is weird. Like, after three or four times of, that, of him doing that, I says, bro, what's going on right now? Every time we stop, people get on, you close your eyes. What's up with it? He says, man, look, this sounds horrible, but my mama raised me to be a gentleman, and she told me uh, that if ever I was in a position where uh, uh, I was, it was a crowded area and a woman needed a seat, that I needed to give up my seat. So um, if I close my eyes and don't, uh, don't see the people, uh, I won't have to give up my seat. So if I act like I don't see it, I don't have to deal with it. And that's how so many of us are when it comes to conflict. If I can just kind of withdraw, act like I don't see it, I won't have to deal with it. Any turtles in the house? So here's how some of us are. Maybe we're with someone, we're in a friendship, or there's a coworker, or our spouse is really sensitive. And we know this issue needs to be talked about. But if I bring it up, all hell is going to break loose. So let me just not even deal with it. Let me just pretend like it's not even there. Because in my mind, if I act like it's not there, I'm just going to keep the peace. Others of us, we avoid the issue because we're saying, look, man, I just, I got way too much going on in my life right now. I'm busy. I'm working a lot. I ain't got no bandwidth for drama. Save the drama for your mama. I ain't got time for it. So I'm not going to deal with it. I don't have the bandwidth for it. I'm not going to step in there with it. So I'm just going to turtle up and act like it's not even there. Others of us, we get our turtle on by just going, you know what? This, this person's a bit much. So I'm just going back away. So instead of stepping in and, and, and dealing with the issue, let me just withdraw. Praise God for caller ID. Um, <laughs> praise God for the block button on social media. I'm done. And they don't even know you're done. I'm just done. Like they got fired and didn't know they got fired. <laughs> I just need to keep the peace. So what happens is we end up managing each other's mess and not really dealing with it. Others of you, you're sharks. You are sharks. You sense something's wrong. Oh, we're going to talk about this today. <laughs> right now. We're going to talk about it right now. Right now. What's wrong? 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 I ain't cooking nothing. I ain't going nowhere. What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Do you know sharks in the natural cannot move backwards? Sharks don't know how to back off. They smell blood. They got one gear. Fifth gear, we dealing with this bad boy right now. If you're a shark, like I tend to be a shark, can I give us a very pastoral word? You're sick. 
<laughs> so here's our problem, we sharks. We want to confront everything. And, and our aggressive posture, instead of bringing wholeness to the relationship, actually kills the relationship. Turtles don't deal with it. Sharks kill it. So what do we need to be? We need to be doctors. When it comes to conflict, we need to be doctors. When you feel conflict in your body and you go to a doctor, doctor's going to spend a lot of time asking questions and trying to discern. And here's what they're trying to discern. Is this something I really need to deal with how do I need to deal with it, and when do I need to deal with it? Sometimes we go to, the, to a doctor, and the doctor says, listen, um, there's not much I can do right now. The best thing you can do, just let this thing run its course. Doesn't necessarily need to be addressed. Other times you go to the doctor, and the doctor pre uh, prescribes a very non-invasive uh, way to deal with it. Uh, here's some medication. Just take this medication, and, and you'll be fine. There's other times the doctor says, no, we actually need to do surgery right now. we got to deal with this thing right now. And the way I'm going to deal with it, I'm actually going to inflict a little bit more pain so that I can have long-term wholeness in your body. So that when it comes to peacemaking, here's what, we need to say. here's what we need to say. I got six bullets in my gun. I can't shoot at everything. Does this issue really need to be addressed? Over 20 years of marriage, and looking back in my own marriage, there's stuff we fought over that we really didn't even need to fight over. There's some things the Holy Spirit just says, Keep your mouth quiet. Stop trying to change that person. You can't change them. I can. Just pray. <laughs> By the way, my wife kills me with that. We get into an argument, and 9.999 9 times out of 10, she's right. She's not here. Don't put that on the recording. Um, <laughs> but she'll say to me, that's okay. I'm, I'm going to talk to Jesus about it. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Not everything needs to be addressed. And not everything needs to be ignored. Blessed are the peacemakers. In order to have peacemaking, that assumes conflict. But there's something else. As Jesus is speaking, Matthew is recording his words, and he's recording his words in Greek. The Greek word for peace means serenity. It means trans tranquility. It's the idea of settledness. Now, don't miss this. So that when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, that Greek word, watch it now, speaks of how we address the conflict that we can actually walk into the storm, into the conflict, with a sense of settledness and tranquility. So that really the idea here is, it is the calling of a ceasefire. The idea of a ceasefire, you understand that, is, you know, two opposing armies are shooting at each other, and ceasefire is called, they, they put their guns down. It's the idea here. We, we, we are going to step into conflict, not shooting each other. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. <laughs> I got a friend of mine, man. He's, he's got a daughter. And as my friend's telling us, man, I love my daughter. She just has no filter between her mind and her mouth. None whatsoever. If it's in her mind, she says it, and it's just wreaking havoc among her siblings. So what we've been trying to train her to do is, if something pops in her mind in which she thinks, I, I shouldn't say this, to literally put her hand over her mouth. He says the problem was... Her and her mama, my wife, were at Target the other day, and uh, my daughter wanders off, uh, and, and my wife is frantic, looking for her, looking for her, finally finds her, gives her a good tongue lashing, gives her a good scolding, and in the middle of the tongue lashing and the scolding, uh, the daughter goes, mm. <laughs> Well, now the mama's like, oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> I need to know, what were you about to say? 
The daughter goes, I'm about to tell you to shut the blank up. The mama goes, mm. well, what were you about to do, mama? I was about to pop your little behind. They both called a ceasefire. Now, that's a little corny anecdote, but here's what I want you to understand. There's a way to go about conflict that honors God. And there's a way to go about conflict that dishonors God. Writing to the Ephesians, Paul says it this way. He says in Ephesians 4.15, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. What is he calling us to do? I want you to be doctors. You've discerned. I've got to step into this. I've got to talk about it. There is a way to do it. Speak truth in love. Deal with the issue. He's both dealing with the what. You need to deal with the issue and the how. Deal with it in love. Why? Because I want to make peace. So I remember uh, my wife got saved six weeks before I met her. Uh, then we got married a year and a half later. And, uh, I mean, this is totally my bad. Early, early years of marriage, I was joking around too much. I, I tend to be on the playful side of things, joking around too much. And uh, my wife didn't appreciate it. I went across the line, joking too much. And um, let me figure out a nice way to say this. Um, she spoke in tongues. She spoke in tongues. <laughs> Slammed the door, spoke in tongues. And uh, now I'm hot, right? Um, the shark in me is wanting to just go full throttle. Holy Spirit says, back up. Cool off. Nothing good happens, Brian, when you respond immediately out of anger. Let it drop. So we backed up, and, and honestly, it was the best conversation we've ever had in 20 years because it framed how we did conflict. And when we sat down, what we said is, hey, we're going to have some fights. Let's talk about how we fight. Fighting's not the problem. How we fight. In that conversation, we said things like, we ain't going to yell. We ain't going to slam doors. I ain't going to cuss you. I ain't going to bring your mama into it, so don't bring my mama into it. <laughs> These are rules of engagement. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat down to do marriage counseling with people. And I go, hey, we, we got to talk about, before we get to Jesus, here's how we need to talk to one another. Here's how we need to say things. Like, did you ever just stop and pray before the words came out of your mouth? Did you pray about it? Another thing I, I want to just say to you is timing is everything. So not only how I say it, but when I say it. I told my wife all the time, I don't need to hear my sons are flunking out of school on the way to church as I'm about to preach. Tell me that later, right? Or when I just step off a plane or get home from work, you know, um, I, I can't tell you how many times I've walked into the house, you know, just planning on being with my wife, and she has one of our kids by the head when they're little. Do something. Do, you've been gone three days. Do something with your child. <laughs> oh, it's my child now. Okay. So we've got to talk about timing and when things and how things are addressed. These are basic rules to how to navigate conflict. Conflict is not the problem because you married a sinner or you're friends with a sinner. And that person is friends with you, a sinner. So they're going to blow it and you're going to blow it. It's how we engage one another. Let's go home on this one. Here's Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Matthew is recording Jesus in Greek. 
But let's not forget that Jesus is also an ethnic Jew. He's a God-man in Jewish flesh, which means that the Jewish concept of peace is shalom. Shalom is not just serenity and tranquility. This is going to mess you up. But shalom is wholeness and restoration. In fact, scholar Dale Bruner says it this way, that when Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, you, should, you could also translate it, blessed are the whole makers. So that to make peace is not just to say, we're going to stop arguing or we're going to stop fighting. But to make peace is to restore and repair the relationship. It's to get back on track. So that shalom is not just concerned with, help me God, it, it, it's not just concerned with, you did something to me, you wronged me, I'm mad at you, we fought, I gave you the silent treatment maybe, but now shalom says, let's go out and get some coffee. Let's go to the game together. Let's enjoy one another. And I know what you're thinking. I don't know about that, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is this not what Thordis did with Tom? And by the way, I'm not saying if you've been assaulted, you have to do the same thing. But what blew people's minds, shalom. We see this difference between a ceasefire and making shalom. Some of you all have called a ceasefire. You just haven't taken the next step to shalom. That's the difference between the civil rights movement in America and the apartheid dismantling of in South Africa. In America, we settled for a ceasefire. So there's conflict, Let, let's pass laws. Um, Voting Rights Act, Civil Rights Act, Fair Housing Act, cease fire, cease fire, cease fire. But we didn't take that extra step to go, let's actually do dinner with each other. In South Africa, it's different. Bishop Desmond Tutu says it this way. None of us possess a kind of fiat by which we can say, let bygones be bygones, and hey, presto, they then become bygones. Our common experience, in fact, is the opposite, that the past, far from disappearing or lying down and being quiet, has an embarrassing and persistent way of returning and haunting us unless it has, in fact, been dealt with adequately. Unless we look the beast in the eye, we find it has an uncanny habit of returning to hold us hostage. This is what he means. He says, in South Africa, we set up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because we weren't just concerned with ceasefire. We actually wanted to get blacks and whites together loving each other. So you haven't made peace when you've stopped arguing. You've made peace when you hug. You make peace when you go back to the good old days of that relationship. Now, why should I do this? I'm done. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. Don't miss it. For they shall be called sons of God. He says, when you go about making peace, it is one of the strongest witnesses to the world. You look like your father. When everything in you says, I'm not speaking, I'm not talking, I'm done with it, I'm moving away, but you rail against that by the power of the Holy Spirit and you actually take steps towards, he says, now you look like your daddy. You do know what they call Jesus, right? The Prince of Peace. Why do they call Jesus the Prince of Peace? Because you and I were at war with God. 
You and I were living life on our own terms, living in rebellion, walking in sin, poking God in our eyes. And Ephesians 2 says, by nature, we were objects of his wrath. What did God do? He wasn't a turtle. If God was a turtle and ignored our sin, we'd die in hell. Nor was he a shark. If he was a shark, he would have consumed us. But instead, he sent Jesus, the great physician, who on the cross took on our sin, lived the life we could not live, died the death we should have died. And what does the Bible say of that? Romans 5.1 tells us, it says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And not only that, but in Revelation, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Isn't this interesting? Jesus is initiating. He's knocking. We're the ones who are rebellious. And Jesus says, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up. I want a relationship. I want a relationship. Let's sit down. Let's eat. Let's have peace. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Here's the question. Do your relationships with others tell the truth about what God in Christ has done for you? Are you a peacemaker? Are you a peacemaker? I get it. There's folk in my life. You try your best. And they're just not having it. You call them, they don't return your calls. I get it. That's why Romans 12 is so helpful. As best as you can, be at peace with all people. Sometimes you try your best, and they don't, they don't reciprocate. I get it. But have you tried your best? So, Father, I bless you. Thank you for Jesus the Prince of Peace. Thank you that when you were angry with us because of our sins, you didn't give up on us. You didn't ignore us. You didn't consume us with your wrath. But you sent your only son, Jesus, the Prince of Peace. So, Father, we, we receive your invitation to be peacemakers. I believe someone here today, you need to get saved. You need to know this Prince of Peace. And in just a few moments, I'm going to call, and I believe under the power of the Spirit, you're going to come. But there's someone else today, you are saved. And there's a relationship in your life that's not right. And you haven't tried your best. And you need the strength and the courage to be a peacemaker. So, Father, would you unleash those people who need salvation, those people who are saved but just need prayer to have the courage to be a peacemaker. May they come in Jesus' name. Father, as we prepare to leave this place, the hand that we hold is a hand that you have created, a life that you've breathed into. And that hand that we hold, Lord God, is a hand that you died for, a hand that you love, a hand, Lord God, that we believe you've made peace with. And so as we leave this place, would you strengthen our hands to be hands not of war, hands not of division, hands not of dissension, but hands of peace. So, Lord God, give us the courage to step into the conflict. Give us your spirit to speak truth and love and kindness and grace. Keep our tongue from words that tear down and unleash our tongue to say those things that build up. Keep our tongue from taking life 
and unleash our tongue to give life. So that, Lord God, we might be known as sons of God who look like our Father. We pray it right now in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen and amen. God bless you. You all have a great week.